Hi, I'm Dan Crane. I'm a professor in the biology department at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, and I'd like to talk with you in this particular video about the implications associated with uh, the statistics asso attached to DNA testing results uh, that arise when we start taking into account databases and database searches. And so this talk is going to focus on that aspect of DNA profiling. And I think we can get right to work with uh, getting a quick overview of what it is that I'll be talking with you about uh, on this particular slide. Uh, again, the essence here is I want to talk with you now about how it is that searching databases uh, impinges upon the statistical weights associated with forensic DNA testing results. Uh, there are going to be three different parts to this particular video. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about just database searches in general. Then we're going to get into a special set of database searches called familial searches. And then at the end, I'm going to talk with you about some analyses that have been done on databases that contain DNA profiles and some of the insights that we gain from those types of analyses. Uh, when all is said and done, it's always been the case, uh, when we're talking about perfectly matching DNA profiles, we need to come into it with the understanding that a perfectly matching 13 locus profile, for instance, is very unusual. But just how unusual can sometimes be an issue in a court case, and these database searches do have something to say about how much of an issue it will be. So let's move right into it here, and let me remind you all what a uh, DNA profile looks like these days. Uh, the image that you see here is an electropherogram that I've shown in others of this video series. Uh, and the nice thing about these automated STR test results, as we see in this particular image, is these electropherograms and the information on them or within them gets easily translated into a series of numbers that uh, are what we call a DNA profile, but perhaps even more importantly here, that DNA profile information is something that lends itself very well to entry into a database. This series of locus names and the numbers associated with it is something that can be very easily entered into a database. And that's been recognized for about 10 years at this point, back to the mid-1990s. Uh, DNA profiles have been generated and that information has been stored in a variety of different ways, different databases. The one big database that pertains most to uh, forensic use within the United States is a database that's known as the CODIS database. Uh, CODIS is short, as you'll see here, for the Combined Offender DNA Index System. Uh, it's a database that's maintained by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And as of October of 2012, the most recent uh, information that I have available with me right now, there are just short of 10 million such DNA profiles that have been stored within the CODIS database. These 10 million or so individuals are all individuals who have been convicted of felonies uh, within the United States. That's the, the one sure way to get entered into the CODIS database is to be a convicted felon. And again, there are 10 million such individuals whose DNA profiles are stored in this national database within the United States. It's the largest database of its kind in the world. The United Kingdom has a fairly large database as well that contains about 6 million individuals. And it's actually a higher fraction of the uh, United Kingdom's population is within the database. They don't just take convicted felons into their database. They also have arrestees and just regular citizens uh, have their DNA in there. But within the United States, convicted felons get their DNA profile added to this offender database. There are also an, a growing number of arrestees that are being added to the CODIS database. To date, there are about one and a half million arrestees, so, such that the whole CODIS database, both convicted offenders and arrestees together, is getting close to 12 million individuals within it. Uh, this database, as I think you've probably already imagined, can be used as a very powerful investigative tool by law enforcement officers. Um, consider this, say you have a case where uh, there's biological evidence that's left at the crime scene, but there are no other leads to investigate. 
what can be done with such evidence is a DNA profile can be generated from it, and then that information can be searched against those roughly 12 million people in the CODIS database. If you find that somebody in that database has a matching profile to the evidence sample, that may well be the launch an investigation that could lead to some uh, important insights in terms of what transpired for a particular crime. So that's how it is that the CODIS database gets used. And in fact, it's been used over 100,000 times over the past 10 or so years in just such a way. A uh, total of 185,000 different investigations have, been, have benefited from that type of search of that CODIS database. So that then brings us to talking about a new kind of DNA profile match. In the old days, going back to the late 1980s and the early 1990s, uh, DNA profiling was used simply in what we can now call a probable cause case kind of way. Here's what I mean by a probable cause case. Uh, in a probable cause case, a suspect gets identified by conventional police work, things like eyewitness descriptions and uh, confessions and uh, gumshoe kind of work that an investigator might do. And then once that suspect gets identified, then DNA, gets gener DNA profiles get generated from evidence associated with the crime and a comparison is made between the evidence sample and the suspect that got identified through conventional police work. Right? And that's essentially the kind of DNA profile matching that I've been talking about in all the rest of the videos in this particular series. But again, with the advent of these databases, like the CODIS database, there's the opportunity for a different kind of investigation. No longer probable cause cases, per se, but rather, let's call these cold hit cases. The principal difference with a cold hit case is that the suspect does not get identified because of conventional police work, but rather because their DNA profile has been found to, within a database, has been found to match a DNA profile associated with an evidence sample. So again, the difference here is ultimately how it is that the suspect gets identified. So let's talk a little bit more about those types of different cases, probable cause versus cold hit types of cases. If you've watched some of the other videos in this series, this slide is one that will probably be familiar to you. Uh, this particular graphic tells you the formal definition of the random match probability. And in other videos in this series, I've talked about how it is that pretty much every word within that definition of the random match probability is a very carefully chosen important word and if you're going to change one or two of those words it often has significant impacts on the statistic that gets attached to a DNA profile match. And so it, in this circumstance let's talk about the implications of, of tweaking or changing the, those two words that are underlined in this graphic, randomly chosen. The random match probability gives us a statistical weight for a DNA profile match when uh, we, and what it tells us is it's the chance that a randomly chosen unrelated individual from a given population has the same DNA profile that we observe both in a suspect and an evidence sample. But again, here let's talk about the implications of tweaking or changing a little bit the idea of randomly chosen. Because I'll sub submit this to you. Searching a database of 10 million or so individuals is different than randomly choosing a single individual at large from a population. That act of the search has some important implications for the random match probability. And the essence of that implication, the essence of the problem here is that by looking at millions of individuals to find somebody who matches an evidence sample, that process of looking is going to be introducing what statisticians call an ascertainment bias. Right? And the very simple reality here is, is that when you look at 10 million profiles, you should expect there's a better chance that you'll find somebody who matches than if you just look at one profile. And so that ascertainment, the ascertainment bias problem is something that DNA profiling experts have appreciated for quite some time. 
Uh, and it's something that people have recognized needs to be taken into account when we're talking about statistical weights. In short, in very simple terms, that ascertainment bias makes it necessary for us to modify the statistic that you would otherwise have gotten from a random match probability. So the first individuals to formally address this issue were members of what's known as the National Research Council. Back in 1992, a group of blue ribbon scientists, a panel of, of prominent individuals got together and generated a report that has since become known as the National Research Council Report one or NRC one, the first of two. And you can see from this graphic that there is a second one that comes along uh, about five or six years later. Both in NRC one and NRC two, it was acknowledged, clearly spelled out, that the act of searching a database makes it necessary to modify that random match probability statistic. Quite simply, the act of searching the database makes us less impressed when we find that an individual matches, less impressed than we would have been if there had just been a single person whose profile was found to match as we had been talking about for a probable cause kind of case. And quite simply, the larger the database becomes, the less impressed we tend to be when we find that an individual within the database matches an evidence sample. Maybe an example would help. Let's talk about something very specific. I think there's a relatively small chance that anybody who's watching this video has the last name Rembrandt, for instance. Right? The fact that one person might possibly have that combination of letters in their last name is relatively small. It's not an especially common name. However, if I told you that we looked through a phone book and we found that somebody in the phone book had that particular combination of letters for their last name, their last name was Rembrandt, you'd probably not be that surprised because we've looked through a relatively large number of individuals, however happen to be present, however many happen to be present within that municipality uh, and have a registered phone number. The larger the phone book, the less impressed you would be. And if I told you that instead of looking at just one single individual like yourself, or looking at, a, at the maybe tens of thousands of individuals within a phone book, that we actually looked at the entire US population at census data types of things, I think you would be much less impressed still that we find somebody that matches. Again, very simply, the larger the database, the less impressed we tend to be that we find somebody within that database that has a particular set of characteristics. So let's go back to talking about this difference between a probable cause type of case and a cold hit case. Let's talk about a specific hypothetical here, all right? And in this hypothetical, let's talk about there being actual DNA evidence that's associated with a crime, all right? And for which we find an individual who matches that DNA profile. We'll have the DNA profile in this hypothetical be exactly the same, all right? So no difference there, and we can also have therefore a random match probability that you generate associated with that particular DNA profile. And for this hypothetical, let's say that that random match probability for the evidence sample we're talking about is one in a hundred million, okay? For a probable cause case, that's pretty much the end of the story. We're t we've got a DNA profile, it matches an individual, that DNA profiles chance of matching that single individual, a randomly chosen single individual, is approximately one in a hundred million. That's what the random match probability means. But now, let's change gears and put this same DNA profile in the context of a, prop, of a cold hit case. Here, we've got the same DNA profile with a random match probability of one in a hundred million associated with it, but now, the suspect wasn't identified by the police singling out one person and showing that the DNA profile matched. Instead, the individual that's found to match was found to match only after the search of a database that contains approximately 10 million people. Which of these two DNA profile matches, 
are you more impressed by? Which of those is less likely to have occurred by chance? The probable cause type of match, one in a hundred million for the random match probability, or the cold hit type of match? The random match probability here is still one in a hundred million, but now we've found the person who matches because we've searched the database. I'm pretty sure that you'll agree with me that it's the cold hit case that's less impressive than the probable cause case. And the authors of NRC2, which I alluded to a little bit ago, actually suggested a, a, a neat, simple modification of the random match probability that takes into account the database search. Simply this, if the database has 10 million people in it, you multiply the random match probability by the size of the database, 10 million people. So what that means is you take 10 million and you multiply it by the fraction 1 in 100 million and you come up with a new statistic. The new statistic takes into account the magnitude of the database that's been searched and we have now a statistic that you can call the database match probability and takes that database search into account. If we did that database match probability calculation for this example, this hypothetical, the numbers work out pretty straightforwardly, right? We had one in a hundred million for the random match probability. There are about 10 million people in our hypothetical database. The database match probability therefore works out to one in 10 approximately, all right? And I think that then tells us how much less impressed we are that we found that cold hit. Uh, the database match probability is only 1 in 10. I would think that for most jurors, uh, and probably judges as well, uh, in, in those types of trials, that's probably uh, well within the range of what would be considered reasonable doubt. 1 in 100 million? Probably not within most people's range of what constitutes reasonable doubt, but 1 in 10, again, almost certainly within the range of reasonable doubt. So here's the thing. When a suspect gets identified through a database search, we need to take that into account with the statistical weight that gets attached to the associated DNA profile match. The National Research Council has recommended that the way that that database search be taken into account is by the reporting of a single additional statistic known as the database match probability. Simply the random match probability multiplied by the size of the database that was searched. Curiously, crime laboratories have been resistant to report database match probabilities. It's actually the policy of the Federal Bureau of Investigation within the United States to report just the random match probability for cold hit cases. Unless a defense attorney or a prosecutor or a judge specifically asks to also have the database search taken into account, in which case the FBI's policy then is to report both the random match probability and the database match probability. Uh, I think it's problematic that the database match probability isn't reported without it being asked for because I think that does reflect the true weight that we should be attaching to the evidence. And I also have a little bit of a problem with also reporting the random match probability. Uh, members of the FBI and uh, prosecutors have explained to me that they think the random match probability is an important statistic to share in any case because jurors often want to know how common or rare an individual's DNA profile is. Again, if you've seen some of these other videos in this series, I think you'll appreciate that a 13 locus DNA profile match is always rare. That's usually something that the defense attorneys and the prosecutors can simply stipulate uh, during the course of their initial discussions of the case. There's no need to say that an individual's DNA profile is one in a quintillion kind of rare. What the jurors need to understand is how impressed they should be with the statistics, with the DNA profile match for the case given the way the suspect was identified. And there's one statistic that gives us that answer, that's the database match probability. Uh, so nonetheless, 
it's worth knowing that uh, in a cold hit case, the statistical weights are less impressive. We do have means of attaching statistical weights in such a case. The database match probability seems to work quite well. And yet, nonetheless, it's important for both prosecutors and defense attorneys to be aware that uh, it's common practice within crime laboratories in the United States to just report the random match probability unless somebody asks them to take that extra step of doing the database match probability calculation. All right, so that's what I wanted to tell you about cold hits in general. Let's shift things around a little bit now and move to sort of the second part of this video where I'd like to talk with you now not just about database searches but about a special kind of database search called familial searches. Let's take a quick look back at the uh, definition of the random match probability. Okay, again, in other videos in this series, I've poked around at different words in this particular definition. Well, now let's talk specifically about how important and the implications associated with the word unrelated in the random match probability definition. You probably think that I'm going to be going in a direction here where I say to you, ultimately, that it's more likely that a sibling's DNA profile matches their sibling's DNA, uh, their, their other siblings' DNA than a randomly chosen individual. And I tell you what, that's certainly correct, and we'll touch on that a little bit here. But I also want to talk more specifically about how it is that the similarity in DNA profiles between related individuals can also be used to help generate investigative leads. That is what we mean by familial searches. Before we get into that, though, let's make sure that everybody's comfortable with the very basic genetics of DNA profiling within human beings. Um, again, we're going to talk in just a bit about how it is that familial searches can be used to generate investigative leads. The bottom line is, is that while familial searches are not very common at the present time within the United States, they are very routinely performed in the United Kingdom using their national database. And the bottom line is pretty much this. Let's say you do a database search with an evidence samples DNA profile and you find that nobody in the database matches, okay? That means nobody in the database is the source of the DNA that's found at the crime scene. But let's further say that while nobody matches perfectly, that somebody matches fairly closely. Let's say there's an individual in the database that matches the evidence sample, let's say 10 or 11 of the 13 loci that were tested. That level of similarity might cause you to think that while that's not the person who left the evidence sample at the crime scene, because they don't match completely, maybe a close relative of that person left the evidence sample. And maybe that means we should be investigating their brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers to see if they could be the source. So again, let's just get back to basics here and talk about some of the actual genetics that underlie DNA testing. And we'll put this in the context of a simple parentage analysis. Here's an electropherogram that shows the results for four different individuals, cleverly named for their own protection, I suppose, uh, individual one, two, three, and four on the left side of these electropherograms. So we're getting a look at some polymorphic loci from a total of four different individuals. And I tell you what, as a fun exercise, uh, to a geneticist, I suppose, at least, this is a fun exercise, you might want to actually pause this video on this image and see if you can figure out which individuals in this image are the parents and which individuals are the children. There's a mother, there's a father, there's a male child and a female child from those two individuals. All right. So if you wanted to pause, that was your chance to take, and take a look at this and see if you can figure it out before I tell you the answer. Here's the answer. Individual two is the mother. Right? We know she's female, right? Because she just has an X peak. There's no X and Y. So that means that she's a female. And individual three is the father. And what's happened here is this. When individual two and individual one had their son, 
one of these two parents gave the son an eight allele, and the other gave them a six allele. And it's not too hard to figure out which is which. The father contributed a six, the mother contributed an eight, and when you look at the son, they have one peak from each. The mother had no choice but to contribute that eight allele. She has no other allele to give. The father had no choice. He has a six allele, and that's what we see in his son. And so it shouldn't surprise you to see that their daughter, individual number four, also has a six and an eight. And it also shouldn't surprise you to see that there's some significant similarity between the daughter's DNA profile and the son's DNA profile. Shouldn't be a surprise to anyone to hear that closely related individuals, here a brother and a sister, have very similar DNA profiles. All right, so let's move to a more practical application of paternity testing while we're on that topic. This comes up uh, fairly frequently in uh, civil suits within the United States and other countries. Uh, an individual, uh, a mother here, is, has a child, right? And there are three individuals that are putative or potential fathers of that child. So paternity tests are done using STR loci, just like the ones we've talked about for forensic purposes. And let's see what kind of results we get. The mother has a 13 and a 14. At the particular locus we're considering, the child has a 13 and a 19. Let me introduce you here to a particular bit of jargon. The 13, we say, is the maternal allele. We know the mother and her profile, she could not have given the 19 allele. She must have given this child the 13 allele. And since the 13 allele is the maternal allele for the child, the 19 allele must be the paternal allele for the child. Now again, you might want to pause the video at this point for just a moment and see if you can figure out which of these three possible fathers is the most likely father uh, of this child and which two can be eliminated. All right? If you haven't paused, you're going to miss your chance because here is the answer. At the end of the day, only the third possible father could have contributed that 19 allele. Right? The other two individuals can be eliminated from consideration because they simply don't have that 19 to give. Right? So individual one and individual two don't have a 19, individual three does, and sure enough, that may well then be the father of this individual. At the very least, the other two possible fathers are eliminated from possible consideration of paternity. All right, so the point here is very simply this. Closely related individuals share alleles with each other more often than they do with randomly selected individuals from the general population. We've actually done a stimulation that, that shows the distribution of allele sharing between randomly chosen pairs of individuals, cousins, and uh, siblings. And it boils down pretty much to this. Uh, this curve that's furthest to the right, with a sort of orange color to it, is the pairwise allele sharing you'll see between siblings. What we've done is we've generated approximately 100,000 different pairs of siblings, and we simply asked amongst those pairs of siblings uh, how many of them share 24 out of 26 alleles, how many share 22 out of 20, uh, 26 possible alleles. 13 loci, two alleles each, right? So a possible 26 total. Um, and you can see that on average, siblings share in the ballpark of 17 to 18 alleles in common out of the 26 that, where they may have had perfectly matching profiles. Their average is significantly greater than the average number of alleles shared between pairs of unrelated individuals. That number is about eight. So, Closely related people have more alleles in common with each other than unrelated people. And what this graphic does for us then is it shows us that there is hope for familial searches to work. Because remember, that's where I want to go with this ultimately, is not so much just to talk about the genetics, the underlying genetics, but rather, could this be a way to identify suspects 
through database searches. Siblings share more alleles in common than randomly chosen unrelated pairs of individuals. If you find that an individual in a database contains alleles that are very similar to alleles that are found in a crime scene sample, but not identical, because siblings share so many alleles in common with each other, there may well be good reason to suspect that the individual in the database's brother or sister is the source of the evidence sample, as opposed to some randomly chosen unrelated individual. The math gets a little bit tricky in terms of figuring out what's the chance that a sibling might match and what's the chance that a randomly chosen individual might match. But once you've figured out those values, you can set up a likelihood ratio and you can start then to say, what, how do you think that a sibling to the individual in the database is more likely than some randomly chosen person to be the source of the DNA profile? And the math actually does get a little bit challenging, more challenging than I care to go into in the context of one of these videos. But I can boil it down to you in this set of uh, points associated with this next slide. Uh, the issues that really end up dominating how impressed you should be when a familial search gets performed are really just two in number. We need to, keep, we need to take into consideration just how large the size of the alternative suspect pool is. That's one very important consideration here. And it works out something like this. Siblings to an individual are small in number, right? In most circumstances, two or three probably is as big as the number of siblings an individual will have. In some unusual circumstances, we'll find families with 12, 13 children, right? But even still, the number of siblings an individual has is relatively small. Siblings are small in number. Unrelated, randomly chosen individuals can be an astronomical number. The population on the Earth is approximately 7 billion people. The vast majority of those 7 billion people are not siblings to an individual that we're considering. If we're considering the fact that it's a thousand times more likely that the source of the DNA profile is a sibling as opposed to an unrelated individual. And that's actually often a number that comes into play, about a thousandfold greater likely. But you put that thousandfold greater likelihood in the context of this vast number of individuals that are in the alternative suspect pool compared to the small number of individuals that count as siblings to the person, uh, that actually can get swamped out. The thousandfold greater likelihood that the sibling is the source as opposed to an unrelated individual, that can get swamped out just by the overwhelming size of the alternative suspect pool. So we need to bear in mind just how big the alternative suspect pool is. In some circumstances, it might just be the other individuals who are on a particular cell block for instance, maybe only another 100 people. In other circumstances, you may only consider the alternative suspect pool the other individuals in a local community, maybe a, uh, an Indian reservation. In some circumstances, you might want to consider the alternative suspect pool just the individuals that reside in the same state. Others, you may want to consider just the individuals that reside in the same country. You know, worst case scenario from the perspective of the statistics here, you might consider all the other individuals that live on the planet. Depending on where you draw that line and what's relevant for a particular case, the size of the alternative suspect pool can have an important implication. And the other thing that we need to bear in mind is how comfortable are we with falsely investigating somebody, investigating an individual that really had nothing at all to do with the crime. You can imagine that for some crimes, our threshold, our tolerance for false positives might be very low. Uh, consider a jaywalking offense. I don't think that anybody would be very comfortable with doing familial searches to track down a jaywalker, right? It's just not worth the trouble on the part of law enforcement, and it's not worth the time of the individuals who may end up having to defend themselves uh, against jaywalking cases or charges. But instead, consider uh, uh, serial rapists or a mass murderer. 
In those circumstances, societies and our individual thresholds and tolerances for false searches and false uh, investigations may actually be much higher because the benefit to society much be, may be much greater. Ultimately, those two issues are things that it's difficult for a scientist to attach a, a, a good number to. I think what we need is very specific guidance from judges or possibly from legislators to say what it is that the alternative suspect should be in some general sense and also how comfortable for any given specific kind of crime we would be with somebody to be investigated when they actually had nothing at all to do with the crime. Some interesting, uh, complicating issues that again seem to fall beyond the realm of science and are more th are, are things that we probably need guidance from uh, legislators and possibly judges about. All right, so where are we at? I'll tell you, I think we're about two-thirds of the way through with this particular video. I've talked with you now about database searches in general, cold hits very specifically. We've also now talked a little bit about how it is that databases could be used for this other kind of search called familial searches. And I promised you at the beginning here that I would also take a little bit of time to tell you about some analyses that have been done with offender databases as they are without actually using them to investigate the leads for, for cases. So let me tell you that sometimes these database searches give rise to some perplexing questions and they in turn inspire some analyses that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Here's an interesting example. There's a case known as Michigan versus Gary Leiterman from the mid-2000s, uh, again out of Michigan. Interesting thing here, this was a, an old case. Uh, it was literally a cold case file uh, where DNA tests were performed on some evidence samples that had been collected something like 20 years prior to the trial and the identification of suspects. DNA was taken from the hand, or blood was taken from the hand of a female victim, a murder victim in this particular case. And 20 years after the crime, a DNA profile was generated, and that DNA profile was used to search the Michigan State Convicted Offender Database, their own state database, which is a subset, obviously, of the National Convicted Offender Database. Imagine the surprise on the part of the investigators when they found a match within the convicted offender database. That's good news, right? You can imagine champagne bottles were being uncorked. But then how do you get the cork back in the champagne bottle once it becomes apparent that the individual who matched in the database is a convicted felon, but that convicted individual would have had to have been four years old at the time of the crime, at the time the blood was deposited on the victim, the murder victim's hand. Uh, nobody is thinking that this four-year-old had the wherewithal to have traveled the approximately 100 miles that would have been necessary to come from where he lived to where the crime occurred. Uh, let alone the, uh, the inclination to commit a murder at the ripe age of four. And so clearly we've gotten something here from this database search, uh, a puzzling lead. Maybe there's something fishy going on with the way that the, the data has been analyzed or the way that the match has been identified. That raises some questions. All right, let me give you another example. Leave that hanging in the air. We'll talk more about some of these potential problems in a bit. But let me give you one more example. This is one that comes from the United Kingdom. R is short for Regina here. Uh, the defendant's name was Sean Hoey. It's sometimes known uh, within the public is this is the OMA bomb trial. Uh, you can do a Google search if you like and find out more about the details of this particular case. It too is about five or six years old. During the course of the investigation, DNA tests were performed on some explosive devices that had been used by members of the IRA, and a DNA profile match was found in a database that was connected to one of those explosive devices. But again, similarly to what we saw in Michigan versus Leiterman, in this particular case, the individual who matched 
in the United Kingdom was a 14-year-old boy who lived very far away across the Irish Sea in a you know, completely different island and by all accounts could have had nothing at all to do with the construction of this explosive device. So again, what, how do we explain this? What does that mean? We found a perfectly matching profile between an evidence sample and an individual in the database, and yet I'm telling you that the individual in the database, by all accounts, had nothing to do with the crime. Well, let me th give you one last example of a similar scenario. This one comes from Australia, and the circumstances of this case uh, are, are essentially this. Uh, an individual a child, a toddler, was murdered. Uh, evidence was collected from the, the dead child's clothing. DNA testing was performed upon it. A DNA profile was generated. That was searched against a database that's maintained by the Australian government, and they found a perfect match. However, the perfect match was to a woman who was uh, on the opposite side of the Australian continent and curiously uh, was mentally handicapped such that she had 24-hour supervision and again by all accounts could have had nothing at all to do with the disappearance and murder of the child yet her DNA profile was found to be a perfect match. Uh, so how can these sorts of things happen? How can we be led astray to investigate individuals as a result of a cold hit with perfectly matching profiles. There's another video in this series that talks about potential problems with analyzing DNA test results. I think you'll find the answer to some of those questions by watching that particular video. But let me tell you for now that that type of question has in turn inspired some additional types of analyses of databases. They seem to be bringing into question this underlying idea here that no two people have perfectly matching DNA profiles. It seems as if that might be one possible explanation for the three cases that we've just talked about here. Not only does the person who was wrongly linked to the crime have a particular profile, but the actual perpetrator has that same profile as well. And so again, that type of thinking and questioning has inspired some other analyses. Let me bring your attention now to an analysis that was performed by the Arizona State Police uh, on their own database about 10 years ago in the mid-1990s. What they did is they took their 65,000 individuals in their own state's convicted offender database and they did all possible pairwise combinations to compare those individuals within the database. They looked to see how similar individual one and individual two within the database were, and then how similar individual one was to individual three, and how similar one was to four, and how similar individual two was to individual 10, and so forth, all possible pairwise comparisons. And let me show you the interesting thing of the results that they found. Again, just about 65,000 different profiles. What they found in those pairwise comparisons is they actually had one pair of individuals within that database who, upon subsequent investigation, were found to be completely unrelated. My recollection is one was a Caucasian and the other was an African American. There's no question here but that these individuals did not share a recent common ancestor, and yet, nonetheless, one pair of those individuals matched perfectly at 12 of the 13 loci at which they were tested. Again, it starts to raise some questions as to, is it true that all individuals' DNA profiles at the 13 locus level are in fact unique? This one pair came pretty close to matching, uh, and again, they're different people and they're unrelated to each other. And you can see that there's another pair that matched at 11 of 13 of the loci tested, 20 that matched at 10 of 13. Um, and so maybe there's an important lesson to be had here. Uh, and maybe that is that the random match probabilities aren't necessarily telling us the whole story, especially when we start to consider all the individuals that we might actually have the opportunity to match. Maybe there are some unrelated pairs of individuals who actually do have perfectly matching 
13 locus profiles. We haven't found them yet, but maybe we just haven't looked for them carefully enough. And speaking of looking for them carefully enough, let me tell you also about some analyses that were done with the uh, Victorian state database. I mentioned before the case of Jaden Lesky. Uh, associated with that case, uh, an, an analysis was done on the database, inspired essentially by the fact that an individual was found to match the evidence samples, yet couldn't have had anything to do with the crime. At the time the analysis was performed, there were 11,000 individuals in the Victoria State database. And let me draw your attention to the numbers. First, they only tested nine loci at the time in Australia to generate their DNA profiles and to put into their database. So the most number of alleles that any two people could share is 18, two at each of the nine loci that were tested. And what they found in this analysis is that there were a very large number of pairs of individuals within that 11,000 person large database that had perfectly matching profiles. Now don't be alarmed. What, had, what was found to be the case is that many, in, it, many of the 11,000 individuals within the Victorian state database were actually duplicate or even triplicate entries. Quite simply, an individual had been convicted of more than one crime and their DNA profile had been entered into the database multiple times, one for each of their different convictions, perhaps at different points in time. So I don't think anybody should be too impressed by the fact that there were found to be many perfectly matching profiles. What we were finding is that individuals within the Australian database were in fact themselves, right? It's not remarkable. But here's what starts to get interesting. Let's pay some particular attention to how many individuals matched at 17 of 18 possible loci. So let's just focus on that for a little bit. A colleague, a friend of mine, um, Bill Thompson, who's a professor uh, at the University of California at Irvine, when he saw these results, he said, ah, let's call this the Aussie bump. And so that's his terminology there. The, the, the reason it's a bump is this. Let's look at the next slide, and you can start to see that bump manifesting itself. Here's the thing. There's a lot of individuals who share relatively small number of alleles with each other. 10 alleles out of 18, 11 alleles out of 18, 14 out of 18, right? We get a fairly large number of individuals that way. And with any normal type of distribution, it tails off as you get to more and more pairs of alleles that are matching with each other, except at the very end. There were 16 pairs of individuals that matched at 17 out of 18 much more matched at 17 out of 18 than 16 out of 18. There was only one such pair. That's odd, right? And so that's this bump, that little uptick at the very end of the distribution is what my friend Bill Thompson calls the Aussie bump. I've been mentioning Bill Thompson a little bit here for the last minute or two. Here's his picture, right? This is Bill while he was on vacation, actually, uh, in Australia. And I think this may well be the inspiration for his uh, term, the Aussie bump, uh, the, this photograph that he took near that sign where he saw that similar Aussie bump associated with the kangaroo's tail. All right, so let me wrap things up here and tell you in general what it is that I've been talking with you about for the last 50 minutes or so. All right? There are some interesting things that we find when we do searches of convicted offender databases and analyses of convicted offender databases. There's obviously a powerful tool here that can be used to generate investigative leads. How much weight should be attached to the resulting DNA profile matches is a matter that still seems to be open to some debate, though we do seem to have a good answer in the database match probability for cold hits. There's also the potential for familial searches to give us some useful investigative leads. The United Kingdom uh, seems very comfortable with doing those types of analyses. Uh, they have not yet been very popular within the United States for a variety of reasons. And then lastly, I finished by talking with you about some interesting implications that come from database an analyses of databases, culminating with this idea of an Aussie bump. I should tell you, 
what that Aussie bump might mean. Here's my personal conjecture, and I think it's the best explanation. It's the only plausible explanation. How about this? What if those 17 out of 18 pairs of matches weren't coincidental matches? What if they were actually DNA profiles from the same individual who had been entered into the Australian database two times, right? But they're different, right? One time they had one particular DNA profile, the other time they got entered into the database they had a different DNA profile, different by just one allele. You know what we call that type of a difference? Individuals don't have DNA profiles that change. However, mistakes can happen in the generation of DNA profiles and the interpretation of DNA profiles. I think what we're seeing in Bill Thompson's Aussie bump is actually our first good look at what the error rate for a DNA testing laboratory might be. And that could be a very useful thing for us to have in hand when we're talking about how impressed we should be with DNA profile matches in general. All right, but that's for another video. Let's talk about that more later. And let's just end by uh, reminding you that this is a, a video that is part of a series of videos. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation that I've used here for this video, like all the other PowerPoint presentations, is available at bioforensics.com. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed the video and will tune back in to see another one in this series.